Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this new uh, webinar uh, at Beacon on tackling climate change through private law, comparative insights and prospects. We are connected here from our headquarters in Russell Square uh, in London. And we have also the pleasure of having with us colleagues from other countries and from uh, other places. So we are going to introduce them briefly, just a, a couple of words uh, about this, uh, this webinar. This came out from uh, a little bit an idea of Albert de Jong, uh, Professor Albert de Jong, who is uh, uh, working also on one of our projects that you probably know. Beaker in this moment is developing a global toolbox on corporate crime litigation. If you go on the website, it's called Global Perspective on Corporate Crime Legal Tactics. And today you are going to see basically all people, people that are all working in this project. We have the four national rapporteurs from France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK. We are going to introduce uh, to you shortly. Uh, so just to go in the, in the detail of this title, uh, as I said, is a work that we are doing in this moment on climate litigation and the intersection with private law, which as you can uh, imagine, as you know, uh, is a little bit less uh, uh, known that, uh, you know, climate change law from the public law perspective. And so in a way, we, are, we want to contribute to this uh, dialogue, to this debate, uh, and trying to uh, put together uh, some ideas of what's happening in some of the most interesting realities in Europe. Uh, so uh, I'm also, I have the honor to have with me as a co-chair, uh, my colleague, Professor Duncan Fairgrave, uh, who is uh, the director of our Product Liability Forum at Bickle, and he's also a professor of comparative law at Dauphine Law School in um, at, at Dauphine University in Paris. So uh, just without further ado, I leave the floor to Duncan and uh, we start uh, immediately this discussion. Thank you very much, um, Ivano. Great pleasure to be with you. Uh, another fascinating um, seminar ahead, I think, on, on this obviously crucial area of climate change. Um, Ivana, should I, shall I introduce Mathilde? Is that like me to do? Yeah. Um, so we have a, 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 the honor of um, having a, a French colleague with us who will be well known to uh, many of you here, Professor Mathilde Utoho Boutonnet. Uh, Mathilde is a um, professor of private law at the um, University of Aix-Marseille um, and research, prominent researcher, well-known researcher in the area of environmental law. She directs the environmental law degree at the, that university and is also a, a friend, long-standing friend and supporter um, of the British Institute, where she's a, a visiting fellow. She, her, her research focuses on um, private law relationships, civil liability, contract law, corporate law, uh, as well as uh, obviously a, a great focus on environmental law. And she has recently published two books, one concerning the civil code, a code for the environment, and of course, the very topical environmental civil liability published by the leading French publisher Dalloz. So I, um, I recommend strongly to you those uh, books and I thank Mathilde again for, for her support and being with us and her work she's been doing on this project. Thank you. Thank you. I am... So Mathilde, what are, if I can ask you this question, what are the existing most relevant uh, legislative, also regulatory provision in France that are related to private law and climate change. You don't have much time, but just to give an, an, an overview of what's there in France. Thank you, Ivano, for this question. And uh, uh, hello, everyone. And I am happy to, to share here some uh, very short knowledge uh, about uh, this uh, typical tools uh, of uh, French uh, law. And uh, I have to confess that uh, this is not a simple question. Uh, because it's not so easy to distinguish between a private law rule and a public law rule in French law. Uh, much of uh, the climate public law regulation has also consequences uh, for companies. So, in addition, um, we can observe that many private law rules can be useful, even if they are not directly 
aimed at climate change. They sometimes concern environmental protection more generally than climate uh, protection. This is the case, for instance, of environmental civil liability. In uh, 2016, the French legislator created a system of compensation of ecological damage, and this system was incorporated into the civil code. The role of this system is, of course, to obtain compensation for damage caused uh, to the environment. But, of course, in this system, also, the litigants also use it to seek compensation for damage to the climate and not also for the environment. I think this is also the case for the duty of vigilance uh, recognized um, in the French commercial code. This duty requires certain companies to draw up and implement a due diligence plan containing uh, reasonable measures to prevent uh, environmental damage resulting from their activities and also those of uh, their subsidiaries and also uh, of their business partners. And here again, uh, litigants use this provision to force a company to strengthen uh, its climate policy. And finally, there are also a number of provisions aimed more directly at combating climate change. Uh, two examples. The best known is environmental reporting. It asks certain companies to provide information to shareholders on the environmental consequences of their activities. And the system was created by the French legislator in 2001, so it is quite old now. And since 2010, however, the environmental reporting system has also been extended to cover climate change also. And since then, I think that the system has become increasingly complex under the influence of European Union law. And the CSRD directive was transported into French law on last December. So it was quite new also. And the second um, note about that, that it, the system specifies, specifies, for instance, how information on the impact of companies activities on the climate must be uh, structured. And um, the last example also, I think, uh, we should also mention uh, the possibility to punish in French law, the climate greenwashing. There is a special about climate and greenwashing. Under French law, false uh, environmental and climate claims are punishable as misleading commercial practices. Uh, there are, of course, other examples, but I think uh, this example has the best known and what you can remember. Thank you very much, Matilde. Yes, absolutely. They are really like the most uh, interesting example that we have in this moment in France. So we are passing from France to Germany and so, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Sophia Schwemmer, uh, who is uh, our, uh, one of our national reporters for uh, Germany. She's a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Foreign and International Private and Business Law at the University of Heidelberg. Her main research areas are private international law, corporate law, and tax law. And together uh, with her supervisor, Professor Mark Philipp Weller, uh, she is currently working on several research projects related to business and human rights, climate change litigation, and also climate transformation of corporate law. So, uh, Sophia, it's a pleasure to having you with us today. Uh, I would like to ask you the same question I asked Mathilde. How does the German legislator approach climate protection? Are there any instrument under private law that are specifically aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, thank you so much for the, the invitation and also for the, the question. I'll briefly try to give you an, an overview. Um, so 
the general legal framework for climate protection in Germany is provided by the Climate Protection Act, uh, the Klimaschutzgesetz. And according to this act, the goal of greenhouse gas neutrality in Germany is to be achieved by 2045. So the German legislature there is actually more ambitious than the EU Climate Act, which stipulates climate neutrality by 2050. And on the path to greenhouse gas, neutral gas neutrality, um, the act stipulates relatively ambitious reduction targets. And these targets go back to the climate ruling, the famous Klimabeschluss of the Federal Constitutional Court, which declared an earlier version of the act unconstitutional because it violated the fundamental freedoms uh, of future generations, roughly speaking. Um, however, in order to achieve these reduction target, the act contains mainly annual emission budgets for the different sectors of the German economy. And apart from that, the act itself essentially does not make any specific decisions on measures to mitigate climate change. And even more so, it does not stipulate any specific duties or claims for individual private actors. So um, this specific law is a framework law without any private law rules. If we now turn to the area of private law, there are some pieces of legislation which are already in place or being discussed, uh, discussed which address specific uh, private law duties with relation to climate protection, but they are mostly um, uh, have been brought about by EU legislation. So these include the green finance regulation under EU law, as well as the sustainability reporting obligations, which also have been triggered by the EU directive. So comparable a situation to France. And of course, um, we are awaiting the implementation of the CS triple uh, D, which would also require us to create climate specific obligation for companies. Whereas the German Supply Chain Act, which we also have, um, so far focuses mainly on human rights violation and creates no uh, climate specific duty. So in, in some cases, it might be able to uh, to rely on, on, on the Supply Chain Act, but that's not kind of climate specific. So as you see, um, most of these developments are also brought about by EU legislation and um, there is a broad independent discussion about the creation of further climate specific obligations, especially in German company law. Um, and it's quite likely that we will see more of these regulatory instruments um, that might well go beyond what the EU is asking. Um, but I'm speaking of regulatory instruments and this um, ties into what Mathilde just said. It's quite difficult to um, divide between uh, private and, and public law here. And I think what we need to stress here that in Germany, there's a certain tendency to be cautious about private enforcement of regulatory legislation in Germany as the discussion relating to the Supply Chain Act has shown. Therefore, climate litigation in Germany has so far not been based on any specific legislation to tackle climate change, but the cases are rather based on the very classic general rules of private law, which do not specifically serve to protect the climate. And um, this includes the general rules of tort law, nuisance law, as well as the general rule, uh, rules against unfair competition. So we also have a, um, a certain uh, cluster of case law con uh, concerning greenwashing. But that's basically all general rules of private law that are not specifically addressing climate change. Danke. We can't hear you yet. Thank you. Thank you, Ivano. Uh, did, did you want me to, to, to input this stage or? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, if you want to present Albert and ask him a, a question, maybe. Can, can I just ask you to go ahead with that, Ivan? Yeah, sure. I'm having te a technical so, problem here with my, no with my Zoom. So, so uh, 
I have uh, the pleasure also to introduce you to uh, Professor Albert de Jong, uh, Professor of Private Law and Director of the Utrecht Center for Accountability and Liability Law uh, and the Molengraf Institute for Private Law at Utrecht University. As I said, uh, uh, Albert is one of our rapporteurs, he's the rapporteur of, uh, for the Netherlands with Dan Morik. Uh, and so in his research, uh, Albert focuses on the interaction between private law and environmental law and technological challenges. And he's also the member of the editorial board of the Dutch Journal of Civil Law and a deputy judge at the Court of Appeal of Arnhem U. Warden. I don't know if I'm from no, correct. No, yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Albert, to be with us in person and also for having this idea to, to meet with colleagues and friends to discuss this very important topic. So from your perspective in the Netherlands, what are the existing most relevant uh, legislative uh, regulatory provisions uh, related to private law and climate change? What can you tell us about this? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Ivano. Um, great to be here. Um, I, th I think uh, the Netherlands also has a climate act uh, stipulating the goals for the for the government. Um, they are actually less ambitious than the than the German goals. Um, but if you take a look at private law, so far there are no specific private law provisions that uh, specifically relate private law to climate change. Um, but nonetheless, of course, we all know that private law has provide quite a fruitful soil in the Netherlands for climate change litigation. So the agenda uh, in the first instance was uh, a tort law based claim. Uh, the claim against Shell is tort law based and, and also the recently announced case against EING, a Dutch bank, is also uh, tort law based. Um, so I think the, the, the best way for me now to explain why this is happening in the Netherlands and why private law actually allows for these kind of developments and why it has been successful so is actually, I think it's important to understand three elements of the Dutch systems and they relate to the remedies, they relate to standing and to the substance of um, uh, Dutch private law. So let me start by standing. Um, compared to other countries, we have quite a favorable standing regime for collective actions, um, for idealistic purposes, so for public interest litigation, but also for collective uh, claims for damages. We don't have any pending claims for damages on climate change, but in general, it's relatively easy. I'm not saying easy, but it's relatively <laughs> easy to have standing uh, as an NGO. And that's, of course, very important uh, to, get the, to, to make the first step into the, the private law system. Um, then to at the end we have the remedies and I think all systems more or less have the same remedies. Uh, we also make a division between uh, compensatory remedies and injunctive relief. Um, and all all the discussions um, about the relationship between private law and climate change uh, are related to the injun injunction provision in Dutch law. And that's actually and this is the second important. Uh, thing to understand. That's actually quite a general provision stating that if you have an obligation to act um, and if you are infringing that obligation or if there is a threat of infringing that obligation, which was the case in the Shell case, um, then a court may order an injunction to stop that violation or the threat thereof. And actually, that's basically our injunctive relief issue. Um, and then the, the last element is you of course, need to have a, a duty of care, and and here the substantive law uh, pops into uh, uh, comes into the to the picture, okay. and I think um, so. Of course, we also have cases about greenwashing, which are partly also informed by European developments. But I think um, to understand the the Dutch uh, tort law system and its relation to climate change, it's actually might be helpful to think as it as an autonomous system. And I think for three reasons, we also describe it in the report, you can say it's autonomous. First of all, um, the duties of care, um, uh, um, uh, for example, for the government or uh, corporations to mitigate climate change can be founded in national tort law. It, it sounds like an open door, but it also means that a lack of legislative action or a lack of statutory provisions um, does not alter the existence of a duty of care under the unwritten law to act. So that's important. And secondly, um, uh, the existence of the duty 
is not dependent on the behavior or policy of other actors. So it's not dependent on what other states are doing. It's not dependent on what other companies are doing, nor what civilians are doing. So all these defenses brought forward in Agenda and also in the Shell case have been dismissed because we look at the autonomous duty of care of the individual actor. Um, and, and, and that's important. And, and the last one is that it's, and, and this relates to the remedy part, this autonomous duty of care can be enforced through private law mechanisms. So um, the interesting thing I think about uh, the Dutch perspective on private law and climate change, although we have quite some fancy cases yeah. and also spectacular cases, they are approached like, you could say in a way, kind of a normal uh, uh, total law issue. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I want to also raise something that I forgot to mention. Just on Monday, we published the third report of our series of national reports of the Global Toolbox on Corporate Climate Mitigation. It is the Dutch report, a, a really excellent report. I invite you to download. Everything is open access. You will find on Beacon website. So thank you very much, uh, Albert. We are going to discuss about this very interesting topic a little bit better in uh, a few minutes. And now, uh, Duncan, are you there? I leave you. I leave you the, the 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 floor. Thank you, thank you, Ivano. I'm sorry, I had a bit of a I had a technical breakdown a minute ago. Um, so I present up up um Kim. So um, uh, delighted to um to have with us Dr. Kim Bauer, um, who specialises in climate change environmental law and private law. She is a um, well-known academic who's won many awards and recognition for her teaching practice, as well as her research co collaboration. Uh, and her main area of interest is in the sphere of climate change. Since 2019, she's led a project um, looking exactly on that topic within, within Africa. Um, and she has just published a book on this theme with Bristol University Press, available in all good bookshops at the moment. She has held posts and visiting positions in a variety of institutions, including UCL, the UI in, in Florence, uh, um, King's College down the road, um, and the University of Exeter. Uh, and since 2021, she's Assistant Professor of Law at Durham Law School, as well as position at the um, LSE. Um, before the before her academic career, she also um, she also worked as a lawyer um, and has um, uh, worked in uh, amongst other things on climate change pub and pl public interest litigation. Thank you. So over to uh, over to um, to Kim. Um, the question I think we were we wanted you to look at was the. What are the, the regulatory provisions or actions uh, by the private sector that are taking the lead when it comes to introducing positive climate change measures? Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, okay, so we're not going to discuss any fancy cases here um, <laughs> because we don't have any of those. But what I'm going to do is outline some um, more subtle actions that both um, potentially displace the need for private actions on climate change or that shape private law duties or, or have potential to shape private law duties to some extent. Um, and I've got three examples that I'm going to talk about. The first one is the Advertising Standards, Standards Authority or the action of the Stand Advertising Standards Authority. Um, these are basically greenwashing actions um, and um, this is about the ASA, as, as they are known, taking action about advertising practice. Um, they, there is quite extensive legislation about um, the le legislation and also common law remedies that claimants could use to take action about greenwashing, but it just isn't happening in the UK. There, there are one or two instances where this is, it is being done and it is ongoing at the moment, including a project at Durham run by my PhD student, Ben Hall. Um, but there's not any big decisions about it. Um, but what the ASA is doing, so what, what is the ASA? The Advertising Standards Authority, according to their website, 
is the UK's independent regulator of advertising across all media. And they supply the advertising codes, which are written by committees of advertising practice. They have prosecutorial authority and they enforce these codes. Now, in September 2021, the ASA enacted a new code where they stated an express purpose of supporting the new net zero target and goals of sustainability. And then they've updated this last year, towards the end of last year. And they've been quite active in bringing prosecutions um, under this code. There's far too many of them to go through this evening. And if you're interested, the Saving Centre database lists quite a lot of them. Um, but they're quite remarkable and quite remarkably effective. Um, so one example is a finding about Shell's quote, drive carbon neutral campaign. Um, they brought a prosecution against Shell saying this claim was misleading because a consumer, the average consumer, would read this and interpret it to mean that Shell offered a, a carbon neutral fuel, which was not the case. Um, and that prosecution was successful and Shell had to drop that campaign. So again, don't have any private law actions about greenwashing, but we do have these kind of very, very effective low level prosecutions. Um, so when I say we, I mean the UK. Um, uh, we do have these, these sort of low level prosecutions that are actually making a significant difference in terms of the claims being made to consumers about carbon neutrality. Second, um, we have the task force on climate related financial disclosures. Um, and, and this is an area where there has been quite a lot of activity, but at a regulatory level. Um, what is this, what, what, are, what are financial disclosures about? Well, um, this relates to company liability, which is something we're probably gonna come back to um, during the evening. But in essence, there are two broad categories of action against corporations through company or channels. Um, one is challenging what they've disclosed about what their business is doing in responding to climate change. And then there's the more kind of substantive duties about what action they're actually taking. Um, so this, the task force for climate related financial disclosures, as the name would suggest, is about disclosure. Now, this is not completely arbitrary uh, because this does force companies to self-regulate. Um, they have to look at their compliance processes um, and, and, and take a view as to, what they, as to whether what they're doing is adequate. But also this does impact to some extent on investment decisions and kind of their, um, their sort of PR, their attractiveness in the market. Um, until about 2015, the, the regulation that governed this was, was a bit of a mess. It was very difficult to understand what needed to be done to comply and the methodologies weren't particularly clear. But from 2015, this the task force for, for um, financial disclosures was set up by the Financial Stability Board. And this was created to develop recommendations about the types of information that companies sh should disclose to investors. Um, the, 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 this this um, task force ran until November last year when they issued their final report on what had been done and the, um, the requirements in terms of what needs to be disclosed are certainly a lot clearer than they were. Just as an aside, um, the Financial Conduct Authority has been involved in this as well and has supported the work of the, of the task force by um, issuing their own guidance as to what should be disclosed. Um, Third is the Chancery Lane project. Now, this is not really regulatory in the sense, but what they are doing and what I'm saying here they're doing is shaping private law duties or, or potentially shaping private law duties. The Chancery Lane project is a remarkable organization and I think very few people working in the law now in the UK will, will not have heard of them. Um, they have an integrated understanding of law and climate change and their website says as follows, our vision is a world where every contract in law enables solutions to climate change. Uh, they have a growing online library of climate cause clauses that are freely available to use for anyone entering into a contract. And they introduce different kinds of obligation that are consistent with sort of good climate action. I'll give you two examples. Um, there's Bryony's clause, uh, which is created to be used in tenancy agreements. And this creates an obligation for a landlord to ensure supply from electricity that's 100% renewable. Um, another example is Enzo's clause which encourages party to, parties to IT and software development contracts to take positive action to reduce the carbon footprint of software development. Uh, which is very interesting. It's actually got a very high carbon footprint. Um, <laughs> so, so that clause is there to sort of encourage a better industry. Um, and also all these clauses are named after children. I think children have been involved in the project um, just to give a sense of the, the future facing need to do something about climate change. Um, it'll be very, very interesting, and in, well, I'll come back to that at the end, but so those are sort of three areas of very subtle activity that I think have been quite effective 
in terms of how climate change is managed, um, both in a private law perspective or kind of a displacing private law perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. It's really, really interesting to have this overview. And uh, yeah, I, I also looking forward to hearing what you're going to say next. But now we, 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 we pass to the second question to Mathilde. So we try to go a little bit more in the details of the case law. So uh, Mathilde, in France, uh, could you give us an example of a case law that can show us how private law contributes to tackling climate change and uh, this issue uh, domestically? So. Yeah, I think that uh, two, two private law systems are particularly often invoked in climate change. First is a system of compensation of uh, ecological damage in civil liability law. It should be recalled that plaintiffs are authorized to claim uh, and to obtain, to ask the compensation and the cessation, the prevention of ecological uh, damage. And this is exactly what happened in uh, the famous French case, um, the case of the century, l'affaire du siècle. Uh, the French government was ordered to take measures to reduce greenhouse gas emission in order to, to repair and to prevent further damage to the climate. The administrative judge here used this regime, which was at the beginning more known as a private uh, law tool. And secondly, uh, the legal basis most uh, used, most frequently used, is um, in climate lawsuits against companies this time, is the duty of uh, vigilance recognized in the French Commercial Code. And uh, we must uh, observe that we speak about the statutory or legal uh, duty of care, um, a kind of duty of vigilance, and not about uh, the general duty of care as a standard recognized in the civil code, as Elbert has just referred concerning uh, the Shell case. It is very important in French law to make the difference and to make a distinction between the statutory duty of vigilance in the commercial code and the more general standard uh, duty of care in the civil code. And for this duty of vigilance in our commercial code, it should be remembered that this duty requires companies to draw and to implement a due diligence plan. And the most, I think, that the most interesting aspect of this legal regime is that it enables the victim, such NGOs, for instance, of course, if they prove they're standing to sue, to ask the judge to force a company to comply with the law. The judge can then impose them to modify the content of the due diligence plan and to include more appropriate preventive measures against climate change. And more precisely, the commercial code provision says that the plaintiff can take legal action three months after sending a formal notice to the company. The company must to be clearly aware of what it is accused and how it is possible to comply with the law before going before to the judge. And the best known cases based on this ground are the both total energy cases. Uh, there, are two, um, there are two cases concerning this topic. Here for the both, the judge has declared uh, the action inadmissible. Uh, and more precisely, the first case concerns Total's project to build a pipeline uh, in Tanzania and uh, in uh, Uganda. The action was brought by French and uh, foreign NGOs before the juge de référé, it is like an interim, interim relief judge. And the NGOs wanted the judge to require the company to take more appropriate measures to prevent environmental and climate damage caused by the pipeline. And last February, the Judiciary Court of Paris dismissed the action for two reasons. Firstly, the plaintiffs in the action had not properly complied with the condition required by law concerning 
the formal notice. So this is just an argument, a very procedural argument and formal argument. And secondly, the actions, um, the, the second argument is that the plaintiff in this action um, uh, was not uh, admissible because uh, the judge itself, it was impossible for him to judge. The case is more important and is very important and it must be addressed before the merit and before another judge. So it is a question also of competence. And the second case, to be very short, concerns also total, but more general, the total climate policy. A number of NGOs, as well as several French cities, took a legal action against the company, and this time, or condemning these victims, Total has not invested in renewable energies and has <laughs> continued to invest in fossil fossil fuels. But in a decision handed down in last July, um, the Paris court again ruled that the action was not admissible. And once again, the judge stated that the formal notice required by law, by the commercial law, had not been properly given. And above all, I think, with regard to the ecological damage compensation scheme, also invoked by the plaintiff, we can say that the judge decided that the letter had no standing to sue. In these two, case, two cases, I think that the judgments are very, very strict, and um, the judge is not very open to admit um, the, the argument of uh, the NGOs in these two cases uh, relied on the on the duty of vigilance uh, uh, from the um, uh, recognized in the commercial code and not in the civil code. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mathilde, um, for, for that overview of the very interesting French cases um, I'm being undertaken at the moment. Thank you. Um, over to, sec to, to Sophia, second question to you, Sophia. Um, you said that the um, it's primarily that the, the um, general pro provisions of German private law which are being used to hold corporations responsible for their, their contribution to, to climate change. Could you perhaps, just to flesh that out, that point, give us an example or, or maybe a, a few, a cluster of examples of case law in Germany that shows how the private law is contributing to, to, the, to that tackling this issue? Yeah, of course. Um, so Germany has actually in the past years seen a number of horizontal climate claims uh, by private actors against corporate greenhouse actors, and they've all been based on the general provisions of private law. Um, these cases include uh, the case you probably all know, the potential landmark case filed by the Peruvian Pharma Yuya against the energy supplier RWE, with the aim of having RWE share the cost of the protective measures that Yuya had to take to protect his land from flooding by the glacial lake, which is surging as a result of climate change. Um, however, which cases that are probably not that well known internationally are um, the greenhouse gas, gas reduction claims that have been filed against Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Winterthal Dea. And they aim at a court order to stop these companies from emitting greenhouse gases or to end their high emission activities, such as the manufacture of combustion engines. And all those reduction and adaptation claims are primarily based on um, section 1004 of the German Civil Code. This cause of action forms the core of German nuisance law. It's actually not a very um, often used uh, cause of action. It um, primarily aims at the removal and injunction of the interference with property. It's mostly used in neighborhood disputes, actually. So the traditional use case for this claim would be 
you have a tree which has fallen on the neighbor's land or which has lost its stability and threatens to fall on the neighbor's land. And in such cases, 1004 uh, civil code may grant a claim for removal of that tree from the property. Um, however, it is generally acknowledged that the same protection is also granted to other legally protected interests by way of analogy. And in climate cl cases, claimants often base their case on an infringement um, or an imminent infringement of the general right uh, of personality or a special right to preserve greenhouse gas related freedoms. So far, none of these horizontal climate claims um, that uh, use uh, the section 1004 as a cause of action have been successful. Uh, one hurdle is the proof of a causal link between the emissions of the individual corporate actor and the damage asserted. Uh, this has been a major issue in the Duya case. Um, but of course, attribution science is progressing, so this problem might become manageable. Um, another main hurdle uh, why judges have dismissed all the reduction claims, so the claims to stop uh, um, to stop producing cars with combustion engines, for example, is um, some sort of judicial self-restraint. So judges argue that it is simply not for them to decide whether a company must stop to produce combustion engines or not. Rather, um, they argue coming from the principle of separation of powers that this is a political question that must be embedded in a whole national climate change policy and therefore um, left to the democratic process. Or to put it differently, they argue that the courts are simply not an appropriate forum to solve these questions because it's it needs a whole balancing of, of interests of all uh, interested parties are not just the bilateral uh, relation of the, the parties um, to the to the lawsuit. So this line of argument is, is quite interesting from a dogmatic viewpoint, because in German, German law, we in general know no explicit political question doctrine as, as in the US. Therefore, these arguments pop up at different dogmatic levels. Um, often when it comes to the question of unlawfulness. So the, the idea is that the corporate actors typically acted in compliance with all legal obligations, usually on the basis of, of public permits. Um, and so far, no claimant has managed to convince the court to formulate a climate-specific climate duty of care and a private law that goes beyond the regulatory uh, requirements set out in these permits. Um, however, we have already seen this kind of judicial lawmaking, so the formulation of um, specific duties of care in other areas in German tort law. So it's not impossible. But in the case of climate protection, the question so far appears too political for any judge to take up this, this task. And that really brings us back to the constitutional question to the separation of powers which I think is, is the core question here. Um, and I, I think I'm already over time, but to briefly point to a more successful cluster of, of case law, um, greenwashing claims have become uh, uh, recently quite popular in Germany. Um, Deutsche Umwelthilfe has filed around a dozen or by now probably even more uh, action against large German company, for example, the football club, FC Köln, Total Energy, DM Drogeriemark, um, and, and many of them have already been successful. Um, however, of course, these claims do not tackle the company's emissions directly, but the misleading advertisement with climate uh, neutrality. But, but here the the general act against unfair competition has, has proven to be a relatively efficient tool for climate litigation. Thank you very much, Sophia. And uh, anyway, it's comforting to note that there is some space for evolution. And also, you know, Germany, we always look at Germany to see if there are some interesting examples. And maybe in the next months or, you know, in the near future, we can see something about that. So we are passing to, as we know, a very interesting legal system from the point of view of case law, as Albert already mentioned. So Albert, can you tell us something that is uh, quite positive about case law and private law? 
yeah, in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, th th there's of course always a risk of telling people what they already know because mm -hmm. both Agenda and the Shell case are so familiar. Um, but nonetheless, I want to uh, point some of the important elements of both cases and also to reflect, or maybe we can do that later, on some new cases because um, you might have seen that Milieu Defensi, who also initiated the claim against Shell, started now a case against ING, that's a Dutch bank, and also an agenda-like uh, claim has been initiated against uh, the, the Kingdom of the Netherlands for its failure to protect Bonaire, that's an island in the um, in the in the Caribbean um, in the in the Caribbean um, part of the world, but it has some elements of agenda. But I will come back to that. But first of all, I think um, if you look at agenda. What is often overlooked from a private law perspective is the reasoning of the first instant court. Mm -hmm. Because on appeal and uh, at the Supreme Court, uh, the, the framework only was the European Convention on Human Rights. But the first instant court actually also applies national tort law and uh, uh, elements of nuisance law and, and uh, unlawful risk create, uh, creation, etc which is uh, very interesting. So I think that's something for private lawyers, it's something um, to have a look at. But Agenda also has been relevant for the Shell case um, and for uh, at least three reasons. First of all, in Agenda, uh, ultimately based on the, in, uh, UP, the European Convention on Human Rights um, and uh, international treaties, but the, the fundamental point there was that the state has a partial responsibility re to reduce emissions. Um, and some scholars said, okay, so there is a duty to reduce or to do your part to reduce risks, even if the risk itself isn't being reduced totally. Mm -hmm. So that's an important starting point. Secondly, um, the, um, the reasoning of the court with respect to its own role. So they started with the acceptance of partial responsibility. And then of course the defense was, it's not up to the state, uh, to, to the court to intervene. And here also uh, article 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights um, uh, pops in, uh, which actually lays down the requirements of offering adequate legal protection against human rights violations. And the court basically reasons that it's the, the task of the courts to offer legal protection against the infringements of legal rights, i.e. in this case, the infringement of a partial responsibility to mitigate. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you now look at the Milieu Defensi case against Shell, which is an agenda kind of claim, but then against the corporation, these two elements, so the acceptance of partial responsibility and the reflections on the uh, role of the court, were also well used by the, the district court mm. in the Shell case. So in a way, Agenda paved the way for the, for the court there uh, to intervene. Um, if we now go a little bit further, so uh, ultimately the court uh, issued an uh, injunction, it actually did not establish a violation of a duty of care, but it established that Shell, that there is a, a threat of Shell being in violation of its duty of care to reduce scope two, uh, scope B, uh, to, uh, one, two, and three emissions uh, with 35% uh, by 230. Um, um, so have a look, having a look at, um, uh, at the proceedings on appeal now, so there was also a question, when is the ruling expected on appeal? Yeah. Um, so we're all waiting. Um, um, the, the hearings actually are in April. Um, in the meantime, we also have to uh, third party interveners. Uh, one was dismissed, but the other was allowed. So this might also have taken some time. Um, but if you look at the what the discussion will be or what the crucial point will be here is, first of all, the application of soft law. So um, it is quite used in Dutch law, so in medical liability law, construction liability, to use soft law in order to interpret the duty of care. So the fact that uh, the district court applied uh, the young guided principles on business and human rights as such is not really surprising, although there is some discussion about whether or not you can also use international soft law uh, instead of national soft law. But the, the, the whole thing here is in relation to soft law, the district court really bases its reasoning 
particularly with respect to the scope three uh, reduction obligation on a report of Oxford University that actually stated it's general accepted that companies also have an obligation to reduce scope three. And I think the, the debate will be about what's actually the strength of that report. Because one reason for using soft law is that uh, is there when the soft law provisions have real strong force in the relevant sector, if the relevant sector adheres to it, if it uh, if a company says it adheres to it, and it's questionable, I say whether this also holds true for um, for this uh, for this specific profession. Uh, so I think that will be the debate and the main point with respect to the scope three emission reduction uh, obligation. And then a last important point about Agenda and the Shell case. Both cases are actually asking about setting a, a target. Mm. So they don't prescribe any policy measures. Uh, neither Agenda, neither the Shell Court, actually they es explicitly reason that they set the target and that it's up to Shell, uh, respectively the government, to implement uh, specific policies to meet the target. But um, Agenda showed that actually the government did quite a bad job in this. Um, so the Agenda target was actually met due to, or to a large extent, due to COVID and, uh, and, uh, and a warm winter. So it was not like adhering to the, to the reduction order. It, it was just kind of luck by uh, circumstances. And now you see in these other two cases that um, um, the, the, the litigants are not only asking about higher targets or laying down the, the targets, but also um, the, the, they are also asking the court to order specific uh, policies and the implementation thereof. And I think this is really interesting to uh, have a look at and to, to, to keep an eye on because one of the reasons what gave the, the, the courts in both Agenda and the Shell case the room to intervene was that they actually only had to set a target, which in Agenda is also quite a low target, mm -hmm. and could say it's up to the, to, to, to the defendants how they uh, live up to this norm. Um, and, and now we're entering this new area, which is, well, the, the all kinds of questions arise, but that might actually, I think that also summarizes the um, successes um, at the lecture of, uh, of climate change litigation in the Netherlands. Of course, the success is that the targets are being laid down, but the enforcement of the targets and the specific policy impl implementations um, are, well, are more problematic. And, and, and then to conclude, I think, because some argue that because of this, because the uh, policy policies taken to implement the orders the, the cases as such are bad, or bad case law, or Ill, illegitimate case law. I mm. think that's, that's not a valid reasoning because the court doesn't say anything about the specific measures you have to take. So I think the fact that, for example, the government uh, didn't meet the agenda target or did meet it, but mostly due to external circumstances, tells us something more about how they feel about the, the strength of the rule of law, to put it strongly, than about the, the agenda target as such. And, and the same holds true for the Shell case. But this issue of how far do courts go, setting only targets, or also giving specific policy orders, that will actually be one of the, the, the next issues in the Bonaire claim and the, the RNG case. Yeah, it might be really interesting. Yeah. And I, I saw that uh, 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 we have uh, um, we have some possibilities uh, also. Uh, we have some questions here. Uh, so Albert already started to reply to one of these questions, but we will wait until the end because so we finish up a little bit our tour of different questions and then we will give some space uh, for uh, replying yours. So uh, Duncan, it's your turn. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Elba. A fascinating, um, lively situation, obviously, in the Netherlands. Um, um, over to Kim. What about the, the, the UK courts? Is, are, are there, is there a cluster of private law cases that there is a, a clear approach to, to tackling climate change, you think? Thank you. Um, well, we've got a cluster of two. Um, so, well, these aren't the only cases, but the sort of significant cases, I would say, um, and actually really nice contrast with what Albert's been talking about, because we've had our own shell case here, 
just didn't go the same way. <laughs> um, and that's the one I'm going to focus on. So there's two derivative planes that have been brought in the last couple of years, Pine Earth and Shell and McGaughy and USS. I'll, I'll mention McGaughy at the end, but I'm going to focus mostly on Pine Earth. Um, okay, so as I said, these are derivative claims. Um, now, what does that mean for the uninitiated? Um, a derivative claim is an action brought by a shareholder or a member of an organization. And in the case of the Shell case, um, this was a procedure brought under the Companies Act, in terms of which a shareholder can bring an action for negligence or breach of duty or breach of trust by a director of the company. Um, these go to personal liability of directors or trustees. So they target those individuals directly. So it's pretty dramatic stuff. Um, in both cases, so in Magachi, this was brought in um, a, a, as a common law claim, but, but in both cases, so under the Companies Act or in the common law, a permission process is built in. And this is to weed out um, unmer unmeritorious claims. Um, and both of these cases concluded at that stage. So they never got to a full hearing. Um, they were both excluded on the basis that, they, that, that the claimants couldn't establish a prima facie case. Okay, so what did clients owe Client Earth's case do. Um, they brought this action against the directors of Shell, um, and they said this was for failing to manage the material and foreseeable risks posed to the company by climate change. And also, they said the board hadn't adopted and implemented an energy transition strategy that gave appropriate weight and strategic consideration to climate risk. Um, they also said this needed to be aligned with the Paris Agreement and that it should have included a strategy to cut scope three emissions. Um, so th these are all the things Client Earth said Shell should have done. Um, th they also said um, th they also said that the board's that the board's failure to fully comply with the menu defensey decision, so with the Dutch court's judgment, was a breach of of legal duties. But more specifically, they relied on some directors' duties under the Companies Act, which is Section 172, the duty to promote the success of Shell, and Section 174, a duty to exercise reasonable care, skill, and diligence. Um, the court just wasn't interested in this. Um, they placed a lot of emphasis on what's called the internal management rule or the business judgment rule. Um, and this essentially says that directors are allowed a lot of discretion and a lot of autonomy in the decision making, um, in their decision making about commercial issues um, and, and their judgments about how to serve the needs of members. Um, so basically, unless the directors have followed a completely unreasonable process in getting there, the court is unlikely to find that the outcome of their decision making is objectionable. Um, so it's essentially, uh, when I on my travels, as I speak to corporate lawyers, they just say these sections are just not meant to be litigated. It's not what they're for. Um, and it would appear that is the case. Um, there were a few other issues. Um, Client Earth relied on a statement from a very senior member of, of their staff as evidence, which I mean, doesn't seem unreasonable for a preliminary um, for, at a preliminary stage, but the court wasn't convinced. Um, they said the evidence provided was partial and that there wasn't any accepted methodology to support the claims that were made. Um, so essentially, they said you need independent evidence if you're going to make uh, claims like this. And they weren't interested in being asked to enforce the Dutch court's ruling. They said there's no legal duty to comply with the order of a foreign court. Um, mm -hmm. So Client Earth was refused permission to appeal this further. So this went through two stages of um, hearing on the papers, another oral hearing. They sought to appeal to the Court of Appeal and that was refused. And they received a punishing cost order, um, so an, an unusually punitive cost mm -hmm. order for this kind, of, um, this kind of case. Just very briefly, um, McGaughy and USS, uh, this case focused on divestment and financial management of a pension fund. Um, so this is the USS pension scheme that is, mm -hmm. as I say, my Becker report inflicted on um, British academics. Mm -hmm. um, essentially what they were saying, to, so there were, there were four grounds in, um, in, in McGaughy and only one of them related to climate change. So the other three related to the sort of financial mis mismanagement of the scheme. But the, the climate change grounds, they said that, um, that, that the the scheme directors had failed to create a credible plan for divestment from fossil fuel investments, and that this would compromise the scheme. Um, and again, the High Court refused permission to bring a derivative claim. They said this didn't fall within the established exceptions, 
that would allow a claim for breach of duty. And this is under the rule in Foss and Harbottle. And they're very, very specific. And essentially, the, the, the gist is the same. It has to be pretty bad behavior for the courts to want to intervene. Um, the court said that it couldn't be shown that the directors had acted in a way that there was a such a way that it could be said there was a deliberate breach of duty or that they'd pursued their own interests at the expense of, of USS, the university's superannuation scheme, um, because they'd, they'd complied with regulation. And again, this was upheld by the Court of Appeal. Um, they said there was nothing to suggest that any of these powers had been used improperly. And there were also questions about whether this should not really another action should would not have been more appropriate so they said really this should have been this could have been a breach of trust claim um the derivative claim wasn't really appropriate again it was targeting the trustees directly um so yeah that was that's the <laughs> the uk's um the uk's new defense if you like okay thank you very much kim and um, I understand that it's also very difficult to talk about the UK system because potentially I always believe there are so many evolutions that we might have, but in this moment I can see also that uh, are a little bit some hurdles. And so, yeah, we see that, uh, you know, we have some more happy and some more gloomy kind of uh, uh, perspective, uh, perspective on this. So we go toward the third question that is like more... Uh, about the prospects of what we have. So this is for Mathilde. Uh, in France, in your opinion, what are the most promising prospects related to climate change? So is there something also that might come maybe from other fields of law uh, that you can tell us? Yeah, in my view, there is three, three major legal questions to be, to be addressed in the future. Uh, first, what place will French judge give to, to the legal basis already used in climate uh, litigation to date. So the French judge has been very strict with regard to the duty of vigilance, but also uh, with regard to the compensation uh, regime for ecological damage. In the both litigations against total energy that I mentioned before, the action at the first stage, of course, was declared inadmissible. But I think maybe things could change. Indeed, uh, this January, on the 15th January, the Paris Court of Appeal announced the creation of a chamber dedicated to the emerging litigation of duty of vigilance and ecological liability. My question is whether this specialization of judges in the court appeal of Paris will have an impact on the way they decide uh, disputes. And secondly, I wonder what role other private law tools might play in the area of climate change. For instance, Article 1240 in our very old French civil code. This article was written in 1804, the Napoleon Code. It stipulates that anyone who causes damage to his fault must repair it. Fault covers a wide range of behaviors and its proof depends on the evaluation of a standard of behavior. What is expected today of a reasonable, diligent company. It's easy to imagine that a judge could maybe convict uh, a company on this very old legal basis. And on this point, the French judge could draw, I think, um, inspiration uh, from the Shell case handed down by the Dutch judge. The Dutch judge relied on a very similar duty of care also under the Dutch civil code. And more precisely, we can imagine that the French judge could order to accompany measures to prevent damage to the environment and climate to reduce its gas emissions by referring to what is expected of certain companies today. I can only add that the question is an open one, I think. And that will be also very important to open up reflection and to explore more deeply the place 
that might be given to some other tools, um, such as contract or property laws. There are less known, but I think that it could be a new way and a new avenue for this kind of litigation, the contract and the property law. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Duncan. Thank you, Mathilde. Yeah, that was uh, really interesting. Um, I have a um, question then, third question to Sophia. Uh, Sophia, you said earlier that um, there were some more specific instruments to tackling climate change on the private law being discussed, currently discussed in Germany. Could you Could you tell us a bit more about that as well? Yeah, of course. So, uh, first of all, but that's something I already mentioned, we are, of course, eagerly awaiting the, the final adoption of the CS triple D. Um, just to highlight what, what this would require us to do, um, it would require amendments to the German Supply Chain Act, but also to create a climate-specific duty for companies of a certain size, which we haven't so far. Uh, and the CS Triple D will also force us to open up for private enforcement in the context of supply chain regulation, um, which is um, something we have so far not opted for. Uh, we have opted for purely um, public enforcement via supervisory authorities and financial penalties. So actually, this might bring on, bring in some fresh air um, to to the German discussion uh, about private enforcement. Um, what the the other thing I was hinting at, uh, at is is um, the broader discussion in Germany as to how private law can be activated for climate protection or sustainability in general. And this is also going beyond the European proposals. It concerns, for example, um, uh, contract sales law, the concept of defects under sales law, uh, limitation periods for liability for uh, for defects. So there's there's a, um, a discussion there, and the discussion is particularly intense in company law, at least from my point of view, which is a corporate lawyer's point of view. But I I think that's uh, um, that's fair to say. Um, so many scholars are arguing that it should that corporate law should be activated to make sure that corporate actors change their business models. And there's a wide variety of measures uh, that are being considered here, um, such as obliging companies to adapt, uh, adopt sustainability as a corporate purpose, adapting corporate governance to climate issues, for example, by creating special duties of the supervisory board, by creating something like a say on climate by shareholders, um, by incentivizing the management board through remuneration incentives, or by introducing a climate quota in the sense of a self-commitment of companies to certain reduction targets. Um, the federal government has not yet taken up any of these proposals as a draft bill or something, but the German Lawyers Conference, for example, the Deutsche Juristentag in Stuttgart has put the topic on the agenda this year and will vote on some of these ideas in, in autumn this year. So, and that will be quite a strong signal to, to the legislator if, if one of these proposals were to receive a majority. So this is an area which I think is, is definitely worth keeping an eye on when you ask for any specific German legislation which which uses instruments of private law to tackle climate change. Thank you very much, Sophia. Yes, indeed, and that's why we are really happy to have you and Mark Philippe in this group because we are having really all the most interesting, uh, you know, study about company laws in, um, in Germany. So. Uh, I'm asking to Albert the same question. So Albert, in the Netherlands, what's, what's new? What are the prospects in the Netherlands? Potentially always as uh, consider other fields of law, maybe, or, you know, as uh, Sophia uh, highlighted. Mm -hmm. um, I think actually the upcoming years, what we will see in the Netherlands is that we will explore or discuss where the boundaries and the limits of private law mm -hmm. On national private law are. I think this will take place on in, in at least three areas. First of all, with respect to the CS Triple D. Um, so of course, 
and we have to await the final version, uh, etc. Um, um, but um, the, there is this Article 15 on the obligation to come with uh, a climate change plan. Um, so NGOs in the Netherlands, but also scholars, um, they in generally ask the question, what is actually the relationship between the European level of protection that's being offered and the level of protection that's being offered by national private law? Um, so I think you could say that the shell case, as it stands now, goes further than what actually the directive requires. Um, and this could also be the case for, for other areas of the directive. And now the, the issue is what is the legislator going to do when they are going to implement the directive? Are they going to, well, harmonize, fully harmonize also national law, thereby actually lowering potentially the level of protection that's might be offered by uh, national tort law or not? Or do we still have our own track of national tort law, which can also be criticized because then you, well, put extra burdens on uh, the, on uh, companies in the Netherlands, et cetera. So I think that, that will be an important debate also because the state of the art in the Netherlands is not clear. So we only have the first instance ruling of the Milieu Defense case, but that's not like the legal state of the art. It will take quite some years before we have a strong case from the Supreme Court. So there's legal uncertainty. And well, there might, there might be a risk if you are skeptical about it that this lowers actually the level of protection that is currently being offered on the national private law. Secondly, uh, the responsibility of financial institutions. So I think most of you, you already saw it, but Milieu Defense announced a similar case like the Shell case against ING. And in that case, uh, which is also based on national tort law, it not only asked the court to oblige ING to reduce its own emissions, but also uh, to ensure that ING is not involved in the negative climate impact of large corporate consumer customers. And here, uh, this is actually the, the demands of Milieu Defense are now quite interesting for, from a contract law perspective, because basically what they are asking is the court to put limits on the freedom of contract yeah. that, uh, that ING has. So it actually, it wants that uh, ING require proper climate plans from the large corporate customers. It asks uh, ING to stop financing and support large corporate customers who don't come up with a climate uh, plan. Um, um, they ask the court to order ING to require the fossil customers to face out or stop down actually fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they try actually through tort law, they try to, to influence the contractual freedom of uh, ING. And this is, I think, very interesting also from a private law perspective because it's new ground, but it's also interesting from an impact perspective because if they manage to, well, if they succeed in this claim, the impact can be quite huge. Uh, huge. Um, so that's that's the second area of um, uh, uh, what is really interesting. And the last one is standing. Um, so as you all might know, we had elections last year in the Netherlands. Um, and for some, unfortunately, and <laughs> I personally belong to that category, uh, we have quite a right wing. Uh, oh, and we have a prospect of a quite right wing cabinet. Um, and already before the elections, there were signals in the parliament that they that the the standing requirement should be more strict, mm. and this was partly response to agenda, but also to the shell case. And what actually now is pending is a motion, and uh, there is a majority in the in the in the parliament for this to actually raise the bar for standing. Mm. So the the current minister of legal affairs he actually said we are going to await the evaluation of the the act which which regulates standing in this case which will be uh, conducted in the upcoming years. But if you just speculate a little bit and given the, the current uh, political climate and also given the fact that these, uh, the, 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 the right majority is quite skeptical, so to say, about this kind of litigation, the, the, it, it is possible that the legislator will intervene and actually you know, shut, close the gates a bit, and then that's. I think that's a really 
uh, important development because it would be a, it might be a game changer uh, for the role that the the Netherlands uh, plays at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Also, as a model for other countries. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the last question for Kim. So, uh, do the British courts just always refuse to deal with climate change? This is my question. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, uh, before I start, I just um, there was a question from somebody called Alice about uh, whether we could bring claims under Section 90 of the FISMA, and I meant to reply and go yes, and instead I said answer live. But we don't really need to, I just answered it live. No, no, please, please. Yeah. We can start integrating this question. So yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to respond because I thought we don't really need to have a discussion the answers yet, <laughs> uh, but, but nobody has yet. Um, okay, so about the British courts and climate change. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going on a bit of a journey about this at the moment. Um, so this is my thinking, because there's two ways of answering this question. Okay, on the one hand, no. Uh, well, yes, yes, they just refuse. Uh, and this is about, um, again, this is about the political legal moment. So we're kind of hopefully ex exiting our period of populism. Um, but there's, there's not really, there's not really sort of judicial activism vibes in the UK at the moment. So we don't really see cases where judges are using international law and using human rights law to fashion remedies for climate change. It just isn't happening. Um, but English judges do develop the law, and they do develop the law using human rights. Um, they just aren't doing it in climate change cases. Um, so, so that's one way of looking at this, just saying it's just not the way things are going. But then there's another um, there's another way of looking at this. And again, I, I, I'm developing a theory about this. It applies in relation to some of the public law cases as well, which I'm not going to bore anybody with tonight, But um, because also you don't want to hear me talk about public law. But there's another way of understanding this, which is it's about how the cases are argued. Um, and, and my sense is with the Shell and the USS pensions cases, the courts just didn't like the way they were presented. They didn't like the arguments. So if you look at the Shell case, you could say, is this an incident, instance of a court going, I don't want to deal with climate change? Um, not really. They didn't like the way it was argued and they didn't like the evidence. Um, the judge didn't, the judge particularly took exception to the, what, what they saw as being a personal attack on the directors of the company. And they specifically said this is an, an attack on 11 individuals um, and they would want to see it backed up with better evidence. Um, and they didn't like the use of a derivative action for that purpose. Um, and again, they also said, as many company lawyers have said to me, this isn't what these sections of the Companies Act are for. They're not meant to be litigated. Um, and the judge says, he says, minority shareholders can use these sections, but they're there to assert their influence in shareholders' meetings. Um, those are the usual channels of corporate governance. In other words, we haven't done this properly. We need to go back into the boardroom and have a discussion there. You don't sue based on these sections. Um, now, whether or not I agree with that is, a, is, a, is a, sort of something I'm not going to go into tonight, but that's what the judges are saying. They're saying, don't try and get us to fashion creative remedies. We're not going to do it. You need to do things properly and use the law in the way that it's meant to be used, which is rabble rouse in a shareholders meeting. Mm -hmm. Don't try and hold 11 people personally liable for not following the route you take, you, you think they should be taking in relation to climate change. And, and very similar arguments are made in Magochi and, and USS. They said that this, this should have been brought a different way. It could have been brought as a breach of trust case, not mm -hmm. as a derivative action against the, the, the directors. Okay, so, so that's one argument. So they don't like seeing these arguments. But in terms of whether or not judges develop the law, there is another case we can talk about, which is Butler Schloss and the Charity Commissioner. And this is a very unassuming and almost entirely unnoticed case, which was in the property and probate list of the High Court, um, or the decision handed down by Mr. Justice Michael Green. Now, this is um, almost completely ignored uh, in the climate change sphere. But it's a very interesting case. It's a trust case. Um, and the question there was whether trusts of charities, um, charities that had a primary purpose of environmental protection and the alleviation of poverty, mm -hmm could exclude investments that they thought were inconsistent with the Paris Agreement, even if it meant a lower rate of return. Um, so what did the High Court say? They said that trustees' powers to invest must be exercised to further a, a charity's purpose. And in this case, they said environmental protection and the improvement and relief of poverty. So they didn't go with the Paris Agreement. They just said, what does the charity actually say they want to do? Um, and the court said, you know, this might mean that they're not maximizing financial returns. 
Um, but if they did their research and looked at things properly, um, then you know potentially that would be a legitimate use of their um, use of the authority that they had. Um, they also said. Oh, where is this bit? They also re-emphasized that considering the financial effect of a decision, um, trustees could take into account the risk that continuing to invest in these objectionable industries could damage their charity's reputation and decrease support among supporters. Now, this has expanded the test under the existing case law. So the existing case law, I'm not a trust lawyer, so I, I depend to a large extent on what other trust lawyers say about this. Um, but but in, in the Bishop of Oxford case, which is Harry's in the... Um, and the, and the uh, Charity Commission, they said that in rare cases, um, in, in rare cases, charities could depart from this principle that they were maximizing, um, maximizing profit from their investments. Trust lawyers have said that Butler Schloss establishes that trustees have a, have a considerably wider latitude than was previously thought in determining a suitable investment policy. So there's a very, very slight um, extension of an existing legal test and again this has been very narrowly argued um it's not being it's not being brought on the basis of any kind of evidence no one's being personally attacked it's just a question about are we allowed to do this if we think it might be important for our business and the court said yes so it's very pretty conservative but i think what we can learn from this is the court will expand um existing legal tests when asked and they will interpret the law taking climate change into account they just don't want to do anything too fancy. Mm. So again, on, based on a, on a um, category of three, that's my conclusion about where this is going. But as I say, uh, you can see similar trends in the public law cases. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my working theory about what the British judges are doing with climate change. Thank you very much, uh, Kimi. It's really, it's really interesting. And also, you know, it opens up a little bit, uh, some space for us because uh, yeah, if the judges as not this kind of role, and we probably can agree. So, you know, I think scholarship, the academics, and also the practitioners should be a little bit more imaginative and try to create the right reasoning for, uh, you know, convince them without making crazy assumption or crazy arguments. So uh, I would say that now it's time for a few minutes of q and I see that we have uh, some very interesting question from uh, uh, the audience. And I should say also, public uh, disclosure about this. I see that some of these are participants of our, of our international expert group. So this is just to say that, as I told you before, with the Toolbox project, now we are publishing every week for the next uh, seven weeks, we are going to publish our reports, the national reports. As I said, the last one was one by Albert and his group. And then we will have uh, uh, this until uh, the 27th of March. The 27th of March, there will be a public event here in London where we are going to disclose the global toolbox on corporate car mitigation. Of course, you're invited. It would be also hybrid if you are on the other side of the world or in another country. And uh, yes, just to say that we are trying also to work as um, what we suggested to try and find new prospects about these issues. So just the questions. So I see that there is, a, I think that probably you already replied to some of this. I see Professor Sabrina Bruno from Italy. She's asking to Dr. Schwemmer if uh, she knows it's true that Germany is withdrawing support to the DDD proposal and trying to delay its approval. Sophia, what do you think? Well, um, the CSDDD seems actually to be one of the many topics uh, where the three parties uh, forming our government uh, at the moment have difficulties in finding uh, a common position. So this time it's the FDP, the, the Liberal Democrats who are trying to to block the CSDD, which is especially curious uh, if you think of the fact that the Minister of Justice, Michael Bushman, is a Liberal Democrat and he was actually involved in formulating the uh, the common, the German position uh, uh, we, we had in Brussels. Um, so yeah, Let's hope that the Green Party and the Social Democrats uh, get them in line again. Um, yeah, but um, this is actually something we're, we're struggling with in, in many areas at the moment in Germany, um, especially the Liberal Democrats who are trying to 
um, open up questions that seemed resolved uh, uh, again. So uh, yeah, I, I don't have any special insider knowledge there, but um, this is what, what I'm getting from the political discussion. Thank you, Sophia. And uh, there is a question about from Eva Maria Kenninger, also part of our international expert group. So a question to the Dutch rapporteur, when is the Court of Appeal in the Shell case going to end down its decision? I think that you said, or uh, yeah. should be this year, but we don't know yet when. <laughs> it's, so the hearings are in April, I think, well, kind of 10 days, something, so quite some time, but don't pinpoint me on that. <laughs> okay. Normally, but I, I don't know how long it would take. It also depends on whether or not they agree because um, uh, it's it's common that you give a verdict based on uh, an anonymous uh, verdict. So that might take some time. They have to write the verdict, of course. Um, but I don't know. But I think it will be early if it is here in 2024. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so we are crossing our fingers, of course, because this could be also a confirmation, an advancement, or a, you know, a regression. So, uh, Diane Duclos, are you aware of the World Council of Churches request to the International Criminal Court addressing fossil fuel industry disinformation? Yes, I heard about this, but probably because I spent much time also in Italy. So we are talking also about this. I don't know the others if they have some insights about this, but yeah, I just heard. But seems like uh, interesting, you know, also to have this kind of. Uh, you know, support. And um, yeah, a colleague from uh, Bonavero Institute, Katerina Ristova. Thank you, Katerina, to be with us. Thank you for good insight to all speakers. What are the main knowledge gaps about corporate crime and really responsibility? What should be the focus directions for research? This is a, a very difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> but yeah, do anyone want to, to give a bite to this, a little stab? Yeah? The, the, um... Yeah. I have at least one, and that's that's not really legal. It's more empirical legal uh, studies into the impact and effects. Mm. So a lot of debate uh, on climate change litigation is about the effectiveness and most of all uh, the argument that it is ineffective or that it produces counterproductive effects. But where are the empirics? Yeah. And, and I think this is important for the societal debate about climate change litigation. It's important for the academic debate, but also for courts, it's important because, well, if you look at the Shell case, for example, one of the arguments is that it is ineffective to only oblige Shell to reduce emissions, but even worse, it's also counterproductive because others would step in, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's, that's really like a walking on ice because there is not much empirical evidence yeah that allows the court to make a good assessment of the, the bad and the negative impacts of climate change litigation. So I think we are need in, in, uh, in that, uh, that kind of information. And uh, related to that, the question, what do courts do or what do we do if you don't have the impact information? How do you deal with these kind of uncertainties? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much, Albert. I think that these are really important points. I would say probably also enforcement of the decisions that we are seeing probably always more coming up in the next uh, year, years. I mean, at least what we hope. Uh, and uh, Kima? Um, I, I do have a thought about this, and this might come across slightly incoherently, but again, Katja, this is something that you have done work on, um, and I think we need more work doing on this, is what are the implications of a fracturing of a corporate form? Um, I say that because I, I, I read somewhere recently that um, Shell has sold their subsidiary in Nigeria, um, which raises all sorts of questions about what are the implications of that for their declarations about their um, emissions reduction. So they can't say we've just suddenly lost some emissions in our supply chain by offloading one of our subsidiaries. But also what are the implications for uh, tort duties when a subsidiary is no longer a subsidiary? Uh, what happens then? Because presumably a lot of the design and functioning of that company is is down to shell. Yeah. So what happens now? Who's liable and for what? Um, so I think research on that, basically what happens with this fracturing. And and, and it's not, it's it's the first one I've heard of, but it won't be the last time it's happened. I think yeah. as 
country, country, uh, companies in the global north try to yeah. get rid of parts of their supply chain to make it easier to comply with. Yeah, and will be always more important because we see coming up always more transnational kind of cases. So, yeah, this is definitely a very important aspect. Uh, Kim, can I just uh, tell you that there is a question for you? Do you think the Finch yeah. Story County Council Supreme Court decision will be significant? Um, it'll be significant. I don't know if it will be successful. Um, it, it will be significant. I think one thing from what I've heard, it's been taken very, very seriously. Um, one thing, I, another thing I would say is, I can see why the arguments that were made were made, but I don't know that if, if I, I don't know that scope three emissions is the best basis on which to. If, if it was a successful decision, I don't, I don't think scope three emissions is necessarily where we want to be in terms of that's where the, where a climate change type obligation in um, environmental impact assessments would lay. I think it would have been much better to go along the lines of carbon lock-in or something like that. Yeah. Just because of the uncertainty about scope three emissions and where they belong, it creates too many questions. Um, so yeah, it would be nice if there was a favorable decision, but personally, I wouldn't have gone down that road. Yeah. And it's also an interesting debate in France for what they've seen. And there is also something, somebody that wrote on this in Germany. So. Uh, Mathilde and Sophia, thank you. You want to add something on this? Because I think, as usual, we are running a little bit late, but I think that it was also worth trying to respond to as many questions as possible. Mathilde? Yeah? If you um, have anything to add uh, to this? No, it's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that you see that it's really late. So, no, Sophia, there was a question from uh, Sabrina Bruno uh, for me, uh, uh, yeah. French yeah. reporter. But I'm, I, I, of course, you have no time to to enter. Uh, yeah. the case. But just to know that there is three action legal action uh, against uh, Total Energy Now. One is based on the greenwashing, uh, but it is uh, the beginning of the beginning of this legal action. And the two others action. One is based on. Um, uh, the duty of vigilance, and this is this de decision that last February, uh, the judge decided to declare the, the action uh, inadmissibility, the admissibility of the legal action. And the other action is bad not only on the um, duty of vigilance, but also on uh, the um, ecological damage. And for this time, also, the judge uh, declares the action uh, inadmissibility but if you want to know further and to go into the details uh sabrina i am uh, on your on your disposal uh, and if you read french it could be also fantastic uh, to read the different comment uh, under the decision i stay on your disposal but i can say that there is also a report in english written by exactly Bakid. And for Ina Badi, that is going to come up at Beaker in the next week. So you will find us in English. But yeah, Mathilde is one of our most important uh, scholar in France. So yeah, you should definitely check what she's uh, doing. Uh, Sophia, you want to finish with uh, a comment? Sorry, it's a little bit on, on the research question or yeah, a, yeah. A, a final comment? A final <laughs> comment. Mm -hmm. You close if you want, uh, Duncan, if you want, <laughs> because we are really going late, but I think it's also worth uh, uh, listening from you, the last comments. Um, yeah, well, the, I, I think to conclude, um, the question could be uh, what what uh, what is the what are the the most promising instruments? How promising is is climate litigation? How promising are the private law instruments? In general, um, and I think climate litigation, based on the general causes, is a powerful tool, and it has already been successful in the sense that it has created an immense public attention uh, for the responsibility of large corporations for climate change. I think that is already a huge success. Um, I'm a bit skeptical, as you may have heard, about the actual process of success in the courtroom due to the judicial self-restraint uh, in Germany, I, I, I tried to sketch out. 
especially when it comes to court orders that should prescribe a certain change in behavior of a, of a corporate actor. And um, so I guess in the end, we will need the legislator, but that doesn't mean that private law is out of the game. I think the legislator um, uh, should actually, can and should uh, make use of instruments under private law, for example, by not simply prohibiting certain business models, but um, using tools of corporate law, as I as I managed. And and another question which which we in Germany have to tackle is is the question of of private uh, enforcement of climate change regulations, so regulatory uh, norms that um, could be enforced via private lawsuits. I think this is a um, an area where private law could be much more influential than it is at the moment in, in Germany. Thank you very much, Sophia. Duncan, last words. Despite just the words of thanks to everyone, been really, really a very interesting simulation discussion. It's great to have such an up-to-date presentation of, of presentations of what's going on uh in 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 the various countries so thanks to everyone and thanks to the those that are participating in their questions as well thank you thank you very much to you to all our great uh, speakers and national rapporteurs please uh, keep following this project so you can read also all the reports that are really excellent if i can say thank you very much everyone have a good evening and goodbye see you soon bye bye, bye.